Okay, so um, Phillips Town Trail Committee, you're up. Let's get this show on the road here. We've got a lot of uh, props and screens. For coming. I'm Rebecca Ramirez, the co-chair of the Phillips Town Trails Committee. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Wonderful. Okay, I'll speak a little bit louder. Uh, I'm Rebecca Ramirez, the co-chair of the Phillips Town Trails Committee, and Laura Bozy, my co-chair, could not be here this evening. They're speaking at the village meeting this evening about uh, tourism and parking, which are very important topics that touch us all. So, um, uh, Marianne Sullivan will be doing the presentation with me today. Um, do you want to just say hi? So thank you for coming. And um, today our purpose is to get feedback from town and town board. Uh, and we'll be showing, sharing this presentation with you uh, with Dan Biggs from Weston and Samson today. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, we will share with you the process the alternative analysis, our favored routes. We will also share next steps as well as key community takeaways from our recent community engagement that took place in the fall of last year. Uh, and then question and comments. So we are the Phillipstown Trails Committee and if you don't know who we are, uh, we've been around for about five years, ever since the Community Congress took place in 2017. Uh, if anyone was there at the Community Congress, raise your hand. Okay, okay. So those of you that don't know uh, what the Community Congress was, it was a gathering of residents coming together to prioritize, um, you know, what, the, what would help promote and conserve uh, Phillips Town. So everyone had a chance to vote, and 750 people voted. And the top three uh, priorities uh, number one was walking and biking paths, number two was clean water, and number three was a teen resource center. So tonight you are seeing um, the, the number one, what has happened with number one, walking and biking paths. Uh, so as you can see, we are a town advisory committee, and our purpose is to advise the town um, of Phillips Town on how to improve the ability for residents to safely get around town without recourse to motorized transit. Uh, our guiding principles are very important to us. They help us because there's a lot of feedback, and we want to make sure we, we have these to ground us as we move forward. So we pasted them near the maps so that you can see them, but they are neighborhood connection and collaboration, equitable and complete streets. Complete streets means a, a street that is built for many users, not just vehicles. Uh, environmental responsibility and building upon assets. Um, and the last thing I just wanna say is uh, if everybody who's a PTC volunteer could raise your hand so you know who they are. So uh, we'll be around here and uh, if you want to speak to us, thank you. Dan. Yeah, there's a couple seats here in the front if you want to come and join us. There are seats out in front if you want to come on before it gets started. There's two right here, There's one sandwiched in the middle. I have to say this is the biggest crowd we've had since the place has been renovated. <laughs> it's not because it's of me. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Daniel Biggs. I'm a landscape architect with Wesson Sampson. Um, it's nice to see some similar faces from past meetings. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot of comments so far, but this is the fourth of our meetings just like this to receive comments on this project. Um, as a landscape architect, uh, the last 10 years, I've been focusing on bicycle and pedestrian trails. 
uh, mostly within the Northeast, but previously across the country. And this is the type of projects that um, we work on to see the feasibility, see opportunity to connect communities. And it's not so much for all those that I am in desire to ride it, but it's for you as a resident to use for your local connections, for your daily trips to school, to be able to walk to the post office, to make those local connections not have to get in the car and not have to rely on an automobile, and to enjoy, to recreate, and to have a healthy lifestyle. So as I go through the presentation tonight, that'll be a theme I'm going to start telling you as to how we're framing this, um, what the intent is, and really the reason why we're doing this study to see is it feasible and what are the steps forward for the town to make this to a, uh, into a realistic trail. I'm with Weston Sampson. We're a mid-sized multidisciplinary engineering and planning firm. Uh, I'm based in the Albany office and I run a New York region. And this is the project that we work on and we're proud to be here and help the town move forward with this project. A couple of things just to make sure we're in the feasibility stage and many um, need to be reminded as to what this means in terms of the process of design and construction. But really the first part of our project is to see is it feasible of creating a trail facility of some sort or a pathway of some sort to connect Cold Spring to the general garrison area. So in our process we're looking at gathering information, at analyzing it, and then looking and see how that would relate to the ground as to what's on the, on the site to relate to can a trail physically go there? Is it going to connect our destinations we're desiring to have with those community assets and connections? And then what are the steps forward? And as you see the graph on the bottom, we're in feasibility. We are here and it's many years even for the first phase of the project to move forward through planning, design, construction, and opening desired in five plus years. So it takes a long process because there's many aspects just as getting feedback in this realm as well as in future steps to move forward to having a physical project in the ground for all of us to enjoy. So the project area in general we're talking about is in the general vicinity of Cold Spring down to the garrison. And I'll go into a little more detail as to what is within this general north-south uh, parallel to the river area. But the, really the goal is to link the important public and community spaces and resources within this area uh, for residents use. Neighborhoods, schools, libraries, post office, grocery store, farmers market, train stations, and other uh, connections within the community. So those are really the foundation as to where we're building these connections for the community to use. When people think of a trail or a pathway, we all have our different ideas as to what does that look like. Uh, the students here in the front, they may think of a trail, it's gonna ride their mountain bikes uh, into a single track, or is it on an asphalt pathway or gravel? Um, but we really wanna go back and think about what is the purpose, what is the need for a facility of this, and how do you prepare a facility to create that facility that's useful for everyone? So we look at many different factors from the function the accessibility, the services, the widths, the context, and different users. And each one of these has a different need that we're balancing to create a facility for users of all needs, interests, and types. When we look at facility types, um, there's two major users that we really are focusing on. The first is the pedestrians, which all of us are a part of, simple walking, but not only as able to uh, pedestrians right now, but possibly with a cane, with a walker, with other mobility devices as needed. The other side is bicyclists. Uh, many wheeled vehicle or wheel, wheeled users um, have different needs. And if you think of a, a small narrow cycle to a wide narrow cycle, there are different needs of different types of service types. So moving from the left side to the right side of this picture, we're going from a more road-like condition as a bike lane or as a shared lane marking here for more of a narrow style user. Pedestrians and bicyclists here in the middle on a shared use path. This is a surface that can accommodate the most amount of users, different user types, pedestrians, runners, all the way down to different commuters possibly. 
And as we move further along the spectrum to a single track trail, this is more specialized users, hikers, mountain bikers, very unique users, but cannot necessarily accommodate every user that would be on a on-road cyclist use. So as you think about a different type of silly type for pathways and trails, um, we're thinking of how does this work within the greater community? No, thank you. So as we're thinking of different facility types, we're thinking about how does this relate to the ground? What are the conditions within our project area to be considered? So we're looking at property ownerships, topography um, from the field and also from our mapping that's available from different resources. And we see the yellow and green dots here. We're thinking about where the community resources connect to. How does it influence the need to have connection in the north-south vicinity as such? So as we are in this process, we're taking mapping, but also walking the field. Um, I was able to take the committee on a couple walks, open their eyes to see how steep is, what is a steep incline like such look, a rock outcropping. It's really hard to get a pathway through a facility like that. So really exploring what does this look like and how can create that pathway within the greater context of the community. In addition, we're also looking at um, what does 90 traffic look like? Um, many have, well, everyone had to drive here at some point around 90 to know that traffic there is not always uh, the most accommodating for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, so we look back at some of the DOT uh, speed volumes and incident rates and you can see from the graph there's about 32 and a half crashes per year on 9D from documented data by DOT. 71% um, of those incidents are caused by driver error which is of not really much surprise and 71% of them occur during 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. not much of a surprise either. So that the traffic over the years um, is high speeds as well as there have been incidents on 9D to be of concern as we move forward. So with all this data, we then take all this information, digest it, and you'll see run through a couple alternatives here in a minute or two. But first, we've been going through the public, through many of these meetings, uh, talking with residents, uh, a couple of meetings. Do you want me to quickly do a quick summary? Would you like to? Uh, I can do it. <laughs> okay. Know, sure. Um, so this has been two years of us working on this study and prior to that an additional three years of, of you know, getting together and organizing and, and applying for funding. Uh, but we've done one-on-one <clears throat> -on -one stakeholder meetings um, including Audubon Society, Constitution Marsh, Hastings Center, Manitou School, New York State Department of Transportation, New York State Parks, Open Space Institute, Scenic Hudson, St. Basil Academy and the Town of Phillips Town uh, Park staff, uh, in addition to Boscobel, sorry. Um, and uh, our public meetings happened mostly recently in this fall. Um, we had smaller meetings because we were uh, looking favorably upon the routes that go in and out of 9D. And we wanted to speak with the neighbors that are closer to pro in proximity to those areas. Um, and then we had a public meeting at the F Desmond Fish Library, and which some of you, I can see, were there. Uh, and then we're having this meeting today. So this is also an important meeting because we want to make sure that what we hear today is confirming what we've heard and you know adding to it. Um, so if you haven't shared your thoughts with us, we'd really appreciate it if you did tonight. Um, and we did a parent pedestrian survey, which uh, John will go into, and, but uh, we had 324 participants. And our future meetings, uh, Village of Cold Spring workshop will be coming up in the next month or two. And uh, we are planning a wider uh, survey um, because we know that you know, it's not just about parents and families. There are people that are aging in place here. 20% of our population is aging in place. Um, great. I think we're ready for the next one. Uh, John, do you want to come up and share a little bit about the pedestrian safety survey? A slide? Okay. 
Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm John Pavlik, a member of the committee and a resident of Cold Spring. And so as part of our community outreach, we did. Pick, pick, there, there you go. go. Okay, yeah, thank you, sorry. sorry. As part of our community outreach, we did a survey online of parents with students in area schools and preschools. And we did this in the fall. And we worked with the principals of the schools and they sent the email out to the parents of the, their lists that they had. And we got 324, I think, might have been 326 uh, total, but a couple didn't answer us for all the questions, but 324 completed uh, surveys that we did in the fall on their views on pedestrian safety along 9D, pedestrian and, and bicycling safety. So just quick summary, a couple of main points. The first one, if your children could walk or bike safely to school using 9D, would you do so? So we asked that and uh, the vast majority uh, indicated that they would be inclined to do that. Either, either they said yes, 69.5%, uh, and another 16.5% said maybe. Uh, so the vast majority, about 85%, would if they felt it could be done safely. Uh, so then we asked, second, do you or your children walk along or 9D in order to get to school? The vast majority there said no. So 69% said no. So most aren't walking there. Uh, they don't feel that it's safe. And then finally, do you or your children bike along 9D in order to get to school? And again, the same, even higher percentage, 88.7, almost 89%, almost 9 out of 10 said that they, wouldn't, they don't bike along 9D because of the safety concerns. So I think the, the big takeaway there is people are interested, but they don't feel it's safe. Thank you. One more. One more slide. One more slide. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, we also asked, please select the school or daycare your children attend. And so uh, there we had the largest number, Haldane, 54%, uh, second largest, uh, Manitou, 22%, and then Garrison, uh, 18%, and then a small number from the uh, Foundry Montessori uh, and the Nest uh, and a few others. And then finally, uh, the committee asked, we're exploring improving pedestrian safety in Phillipstown. Would this be of interest to you? Nine, over 90%, more than 9 out of 10, said yes, that would be of interest to them. Thank you. Thank you. As somebody that bikes that 90 often, it's currently not safe, I can tell you. <laughs> not a safe ride. Uh, so this is, um, you know, we just were documenting a little bit how the street is utilized, uh, how it's being used. And uh, so we just have a couple of photos here. We have... Um, 20% of, uh, of our residents are, are, sorry, we have 20% of our households are families. And um, so we've been seeing, you know, children on bikes and they're, it's great that they're on their bikes, but sometimes they're on their sidewalks. And so um, just noting that, but uh, Manitou did request a, um, a safer crossing for their parents. So we, we just, went to a visit with Manitou and documented some of that. Move over here. Okay, overview of the corridor. So as I mentioned, we're looking at the overall corridor from Cold Spring to Garrison. And we broke it up into four different areas, which I'm gonna run through here with Mary Ann. Uh, and from, but basically the goal is looking to connect from north to south, uh, running through each of those. So the first area at the north, Cold Spring, um, you can see we looked at many different alternatives. And for each of these, we're going to highlight one favorite route. Um, starting at Cold Spring Station, moving south towards the 90 corridor, um, we looked at what would connections be to make a, a pathway connect. Um, after some discussions with the committee, they decided that the edge of Cold Spring would be the logical terminus. Uh, for a, a pathway of the favored route heading south of 9D. Um, looking at the overall Cold Spring neighborhood area, um, we acknowledge that a lot of people can connect or can circulate in those neighborhood streets or local streets to make that connection to make the 9D corridor being the favored route to get to south, the southern connections within the community. Excuse me, that big yellow dot, where is that? Right at the bridge at the cold. That's what I thought. But by yep. Downey Oil, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, so for each of these, we're going to run through a number of pros and cons for the all terms that we considered for the route. Do you want to tag team this? <laughs> okay. Although I'm kind of looking sideways. Yeah, it's hard to see. Oh, here. Okay. So um, for Route A1, 
Um, we thought that, you know, this is obviously a very nice route down at the Foundry Preserve. It's really beautiful. It connects to the train station. So those are obvious um, pros for, for starting there. Um, some of the cons, though, have to do with um, it, it's not currently a multi-use path, or some areas of it are not a multi-use path, and that is a goal of ours. Um, so uh, bicyclists would have to dismount or walk their bikes on some areas. We'd have to connect with Scenic Hudson and see if they might be willing to work with us on that. Um, for Route A2, which is our favored route, it definitely provides connectivity to um, Cold Spring and Nelsonville amenities. And um, just recall that connecting to community resources is a key goal of the plan. So it, it definitely meets that. And then the flatter terrain promotes accessibility for all different types of users, which is another key goal of ours. However, um, it, because of where it's starting, it would not facilitate improvements in Cold Spring, complete streets types improvement in Cold Spring. Um, so that route kind of avoids the heart of the village. Exactly, okay. yes, <clears throat> yes. Can you point to where it starts? Oh, yeah, Dan, can you point to where it starts? I'm sorry, Jim, so, in here. So A2. Right, right, basically at the bridge on the Cold Spring side, more or less. Where, where would people park? Or so, what's, your, well, what's your vision for everybody starting at that yellow spot? We're hoping that they start by walking because it's really meant to be for residents, um, for residents moving, you know, walking to school, walking to the farmer's market. So we're not envisioning. Um, You're not, you don't think tourists are going to come and, no? Oh, okay. Well, Just checking. The, well, it's definitely, the plan is to build it around the needs of the residents mm -hmm. and residents moving from community, from where they live to a community resource. Um, that's sort of the overarching. Yeah. I, I think we can hold the comments more for the, the conversation at the end, but the general idea is that um, this really would not be having one local, one connection point. Um, the neighborhood, the community here would maybe basically um, ride or walk to get to a one common point of where the pathway would run most of the long 9D. So there would not be one parking lot, one general city that would be the congregation point, and then motorists would then get out of their cars and walk as such, the intent of what we're looking at. But as we're talking about each of these areas, the key that we want to get to tonight is that there's four areas uh, which have, could be many different phases of a project. The key is coming up with what is the area of the project that makes the most sense to make those community connections to get from your resources, from neighborhoods, to the post office, to the grocery store. So is used by people in this room is intent. It's not that tourist route that we may hear from other trails in the area. Um, that's not the priority to why we're trying to create this pathway network within the town. Sure, so why don't we get through the presentation and then we'll Thank open you. up to questions? How does that so the next area B will you be able to answer questions at the end? I'm sure. Yeah, so I'm going to run through each of the, the corridors. Um, you'll see that area B, which starts um, at the terminus of area A, primary favored route is along 9D as such. I'm continuing down, as you'll note here. Um, there are possible alternatives on either side of the 9D. Uh, due to the context of 9D, uh, knowing that we don't have right-of-way information that's defined yet, and we've gotten all the mapping available from DOT, but that is a critical component to know what is the width, what the lands are within the 9D corridor, you know if it's on either side. You see we've noted two possible crossings of 9D, knowing one by the Manto School, one in just general vicinity of Boscobel, um, that if there is a crossing, we want it to be safe. So we want to make sure that motorists will be slowed down or stopped potentially to give pathway users a chance to cross. Or if there's users that are in the one side of the street that they have that connection point to get to the other side of the pathway. So the favorite route continues along 9D. Um, past basketball or possibly within the basketball lands. Um, they are welcoming to having more users within their space, uh, continuing down along to the existing bridge of Indian Brook. I'm right. So okay. right Indian Brook Road. Correct. So Indian Brook Road. Uh, <laughs> that would not be a pathway, sir. 
comments at the end. Uh, that would not be a pathway, but I'd be using a shared street. So in that case, it would be a shared use path along Boscobel and terminate onto the street, and then using a slow street down to the current bridge that's under the 90 underpass. So area B, we did mention the 90 corridor. We did look at other connections within this, um, this area, uh, primarily along the, the existing wetlands area before here. Um, after further investigation, um, knowing of different resources that are here from environmental resources, land ownerships, um, this was not the preferred route, but we did look at that as a possibility. And also noting that Although it's desirable from a view shed standpoint or from a scenic recreation standpoint, it really is not providing additional connections to resources within the community. Other connections or other possible alignments, I uh, see parallel to 9D. Um, here there is in B3, um, there is land ownerships by Boswell. This could be a possibility as a off 9D corridor alignment uh, if, the, if the connections could happen across 9D. Area C, this is just south, so mostly in the St. Basil Academy. Um, you'll note here that there is not a preferred or favored route. The reason that we have not had the, um, the response from St. Basil at this point that they are allowing a pathway connection through their lands. You can see that we are looking at possibly uh, the former uh, Route 9 corridor within St. Basil lands um, or possibly along the 9D corridor in front of St. Basil's. And then we have basically looked at along the wetland area, uh, which is due to severe grades, really would not be feasible from this standpoint. So it's either a C3 or a C1 within this area of the project. As I mentioned, there's many resources within this area. So the C2, steep slopes, wetlands, also property ownerships. Uh, and then basically along C1 and C3, right away will become a uh, consideration for this area of the project. Moving further south below Town Park, um, you can see here the favorite route is primarily along the 9D corridor, connecting down to a new possible crossing and the existing crossing by the school, and eventually down to Desmond Fish Library and the Phillipstown Rec Center. Um, in this alignment, uh, we did look at D1, which is primarily uh, on private lands. It did not seem feasible. Really, again, a scenic route was not really connecting to resources within the community. And the other connections here around the upper and lower station road, um, really these connections uh, were not preferred because the 9D corridor really would give you that connection down to different resources within the community itself. Again, mentioning the connections with the community. Um, this route uh, is shown here primarily on the western side of the route, uh, but would uh, connect over across 9D to get on the library side of the road, uh, knowing of the lands possibly available. But again, confirmation of a right away really is critical within the next stages of the project. So as we move forward, um, we had some key takeaways within the community process for feedback, which we want to highlight some of the positive reactions, also the concerns we've heard from communities so far. So we thought it would be good to kind of summarize the takeaways from the community process we've done so far. Um, and just to, we mentioned this earlier, but we did the online surveys, we've done neighbors meetings, we did community-wide meetings with um, extensive Q&A and discussion periods. We've also gotten feedback through short pen and paper surveys that we distributed at community meetings. We've received written comments via email and letters. And we've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with institutional stakeholders, a total of 14 of those. We have some upcoming meetings as well in an attempt to you know, really hear from a, a wide range of community stakeholders. When we submit our final report on the feasibility study, we'll have done an in-depth analysis of all of the feedback. But for tonight, just to summarize some of the key things that we've heard, um, we've definitely heard that there's broad support for a path, some type of path that links neighborhoods and community resources. So gets people out of their cars and walking and biking 
to um, spaces in the community that they use every day. Um, people see a variety of uses for what we've proposed. Some people said they could see using the entire path as a recreational path or for exercise, while others say that they would only see themselves using shorter segments of the path. Um, we also heard really clearly from feedback, community feedback, that any path that is built needs to be accessible for all types of users, all ages, abilities, um, and different types of use, biking, running, etc. cetera. Um, and again, um, we've mentioned safety several times, but safety keeps coming up again and again as a, as a big concern and a big priority for the community. Any path that is created should improve current conditions. Um, many residents um, view what's going on right now as unsafe. People are using 9D to bike and to walk, and it is an unsafe situation. Um, in terms of the concerns that we heard, um, certainly uh, property owners along the proposed route had unique or particular concerns, um, and some of these were that uh, a, a path could uh, potentially impact their personal property. Um, they're also concerned about safety for themselves and also for path users, particularly in any proposed sections that uh, are along 9D that cross people's driveways, that getting in and out of driveways could be a concern. Um, there were also other concerns about who would use the trail and possible overuse, um, in including would a path attract more non-residents to the area? Um, would a path be consistent with protecting the sensitive ecology, say down at Indian Brook or other areas that people are concerned about? Um, and also would enough people use the path to warrant the effort to create it? So those are some of the um, concerns and things that we think um, need further consideration. And then finally, um, this is not the focus of tonight's conversation, but we wanted to just report back to you very briefly and we'll go into more detail in our final report. But we heard so many issues about safety and transportation concerns in the community and the general sense that there's no overarching plan for the town in terms of how to handle transportation issues. And so um, we, we kind of put all of those under the umbrella of the town needs a more proactive plan for um, complete streets and managing transportation issues, making the town accessible to people who are not drivers and also providing other types of um, uh, transportation options. Okay, so just to um, wrap up and to reiterate the purpose of why we're here tonight, um, we'd love to answer any questions that the town board might have or the public might have about proposed routes or the process. Um, we also want to listen to feedback from people who have come and we're recording that feedback um, so that we can also integrate it into the feasibility study. And then we'd like to hear what both the town board and the public think about the preferred routes that we have laid out. And also if there are any thoughts about areas that should be prioritized, either A, B, C, or D, we obviously know that what we're laying out is a very large project and it would have to be broken down into chunks, which is why we've presented it in the way that we have as these discrete areas. Um, and then just to remind people of where we are in the process, we're really at the very beginning of what is a long and complex um, process. So we're just in the feasibility stage and just at the point of listening and hearing feedback and taking all of that into consideration. Thank you. Well, thank you so much um, for all the work that you've all put in, Laura and Rebecca. I know you've done it tremendous. And the entire Trails Committee. Um, it was formed, I think it was five five years you've been at it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great undertaking. And the inclusiveness that you've just survey after survey, meeting after meeting, it's great. So um, to me, I mean, the process, and I think what we're trying to address is serving the local population, right. not making it a, um, a tourist attraction, not bringing more people. This is so... Uh, your child can get on his bike and go from Haldane to the rec center 
uh, on a safe a safe route, and and I think that's that's what we're looking for. To me, it seems like the more scenic route along the water obviously is going to draw tourism in in my eyes. And this is just me thinking as um, you know, as a resident, as a biker, a hiker. But I mean, it would be beautiful. But I think we have something going on in the other direction to uh, to take care of that. But uh, which is not connected to this by any means. Right, so two separate things. Um, so. Uh, the way I look at it is you, the two hubs are basically the Cold Spring train station and the Phillipstown Rec Center. Uh, uh, right? Is that? Yeah, we start off by saying that the train stations were our common hub, but right. as we actually looked into it further, it's, it's not so much the train stations as a destination, it's right. the neighborhoods. But you can, you can access it from that neighborhood. I'm yes. just trying to make it simple for yep. me. It's, that's the two ends, Correct. basically. The village of Cold That's Spring fine. and the rec center. And a lot of the concerns we have at the rec center, and we've attempted teen centers, and it's just it's not easy for kids to get from Cold Spring to the rec center. So um, that's always been a concern locally, getting your kids to be, it's, you gotta drive them. So, I mean, this would certainly assist with that. Um, the inland streets seems like to me it would be more of a um, resident friendly um, route rather than the uh, the scenic route along along the Hudson, which again I think will just draw um, more tourism and, and concerns with parking and and so on. But I think if we utilize the roads that we currently have, I mean I would love a safe bike route on 9D. That would certainly be it's so narrow now, but um, it would be wonderful to be able to make a safe trip from Cold Spring to the rec center without um, being swiped at by cars. But um, I will open it to the board. Um, um, for I agree John, with Supervisor like and Hassel yeah. that um, it would be great to have a safe bike lane. Um, I've been to other towns and communities where they have more space for a bike. And one, when my daughter was at the rec center, I had hoped that she'd be able to take a bike. There's no way on 9D that you could take a bike no, down there. Yes, I even attempted to walk it. I am a great walker, and after the Castle to River run this year, I attempted to walk back home and had to have a ride pick me up. It, it is impossible. There is no way. And I think for people that live here, that should be possible. I really do. Um, I just have a question whether or not on... On 9D, at the edge of Cold Spring, we have senior housing, Chestnut Ridge. Were they engaged in a discussion of this? Because they have raised safety issues as well on 9D. So, uh, sorry, I should get this on. So we've begun the conversation. Um, we, we did drop off our flyers so that uh, Priscilla Goldfarb handed out f to residents so that they would know about our meetings. But. Um, but there hasn't been, which is why we were, there hasn't been enough. It's never enough. It's never enough feedback. Um, and that's why we're going to be doing, we're planning it for the, the next ask of funding would, a portion of that would go towards helping us launch a community wide survey that would include, uh, we're thinking in an, of an every door direct mailer uh, where the cost is lower for the postage and every household gets the survey. Um, so we have that, that's where my response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions that I, I want to address. Um, as John mentioned, yes, it would be great to get down to the rec center. That, I mean, my kids go to there three, four times a week, five days a week sometimes. My concern is more so the residents that you guys think that the trails are going to go through, the, the people that live on Indian Brook, the homes within where your yellow dot is, those people already use the footpath to get to Food Town, the post office, the bank. So I'm curious on what, what else you, you want to bring. There's already footpaths that take us to our community. So if you're if you're just driven by this, by the bike path from, as John mentioned, the train station to the rec center, yes, I understand that that is, a, that's wonderful, but you're going along a very busy road 
that people commute on from Fishkill, Wappingers, Poughkeepsie. I mean, like, I just, it's hard for me to see this vision, especially when there's homeowners that live on Indian Brook, and now you're like, oh, we're, we're, you're going to put a path by somebody's home? I, I, it's really hard for me to get on board with what your vision is. So uh, I'll go back to one of the slides that had the dots, uh, yellow dots, and I think that that identifies a number of the resources that are within the corridor that are in between the rec center and the train stations. Um, Boscobel comes to mind, but as you can see, there's several other dots in here uh, of other resources, the town park. So being able to ride or walk to go out to town park and back from Garrison, um, being able to uh, actually start in your house and get on a, tr a pathway and go down to the school and back. Right. So it's those local rides and walks is really the critical piece to this. It's not so much the long, because this is going to take many years for this to ever to happen, but it's more about the local connections to get to the post office or the grocery store. Um, although you may have that connection up here in the village core or uh, some pieces down here, it's the other connections mm -hmm. for those residents that are coming down to 9D now that they cross and can take a pathway down to school or down to the library. Uh -huh. It's those smaller connections that really right. is going to make the benefit and the long, long, the long length of this mm -hmm. really is the ultimate vision. It was going to take a long time for that to be and implemented. I, I actually have one other thing. Your presentation was wonderful, but I did not see anything in there for uh, any handicap accessible for any of the people supported within our community. So of any pathway, it's proposed to be accessible. Um, for a pathway that's within a right-of-way of the road, um, per our guidance for state and federal mandates, we have to make them accessible. ADA. So, so they'll, they'll all be handicapped accessible. They would be a handicap. Okay. Uh, the key to that is, is that a pathway within the right-of-way um, can be no steeper than the current slope or the, the undulations of the road. So that's key in mind. So if you have a steep grade on a, on a road, the pathway is going to mirror it. If it's shallow of a road, very gradual, it's going to mirror it. If you're off into the uh, other lands not within right away, it's a different situation. So if you look at the road, if it's, that's where the cars are going, that's more or less the grade that the path would be as well for users, walkers, bikers, accessible use. Okay. Bobby, Jason. Uh, I'm just curious, what's the mileage from, say, Downing Whale down to the rec center? How many miles is that? I want to... Six. It's like 5.2 something. Five miles, roughly. Five, five, so, six, yeah, around yeah. that. Well, along those five miles, and we have, you have, we have a lot of, you know, like got Boscobel, we have the Garrison, Garrison too. We got a lot of properties that I think were, aren't really private, that could be accessible, and I'm sure you went to do due diligence on that. So, again, I want to make people understand this is for, it's based for local people we're not trying to build this for tourists to come here i don't think um, obviously on a weekend you're going to have more people using it because there's going to be some tourists that may want to use this but it's based for our local community access i mean i guess i'll just follow up on that point that you know every member who is a member of the phillips sound trails committee is someone who lives here and so as someone who lives here we're, we all know that there's concerns about the number of people that are up here Right. So it's not done, you know, outside of that vein. And I, I think it is important, you know, this idea that when the effort started, the beginning of the trail and the end of the trail were the train stations. But as it moved forward, it became clear that if you're really trying to make it accessible for local use as much as possible, that starting from, you know, the village of Cold Spring uh, at the bridge, which has its own barriers, and the Phillipstown Recreation Department is about local use, you know. And so that's, that's something important. I think the, the point you made, um, John, about is not the scenic route <laughs> necessarily. You know, it's the route that you would use if you're trying to get in between places in your community. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a really important point. And I guess the second point I would make is that, you know, I think many of us who have been here a long time, we know that any good idea is not a new idea. And that there have been people who have been talking about how to try to build this sort of connection for a really long time. Um, and I would say that, you know, uh, what may be new about this effort is just the, 
as you can see from the volunteers, the exhaustive amount of work that's been put in to look at all of the alternatives. I mean, to look at 9D, to try to identify what the right of way is that 9D controls, um, how to establish that. Uh, if, if some of those 9D corridors are very difficult, are there other ways to work around them by working, you know, looking at institutional partners like Boscobel, like uh, St. Basil's? Are there ways around those tough areas that make sense? Um, but, you know, this is, this is so early in the process, and when you talk about starting by a bridge, you know, there needs to be more work to be done that would say, you know, uh, to, to determine some of those right of ways. But, I, you know, I would say that there's been some promising things, like the Trails Committee had a meeting with the Department of Transportation, uh, and they said this has been a priority for us for a long time, some sort of a safe walking and biking trail. If you can build it in the Department of Transportation 90 right of way, we would permit it. That's a long way off, but it's in the sense of trying to determine what, what that right of way is and, and how, how to build it. So um, it's, it's the beginning of a, a, of a process, which seems amazing because it's been five years. Um, but, but really, it's, a, it's about kind of getting all the information needed to see if this is realistic or possible. You know. I just have one more question. So are these, is this, are these trails going to be funded by grants? So, uh, or the generosity of the community. Uh, so there's, hold on, one, I just wanted to really quick respond to something that Jason said that was very important. Uh, you said we've been doing this work for five years, but people actually started some of this work prior to even the committee existing. And that's the 9D corridor management plan that was a study that was done in early 2000s. So th there's been decades um, of the demand being shown in studies. And I brought for you all a binder of some of them, but also of the feedback so that even though we're not giving you a final report until later, you can start to see what the town is saying. Uh, in regards to funding, these projects typically get funded through county, state, and federal dollars, and they all happen through grants. So each phase would have to be planned for an application, and that application would only happen with the town saying, we want you to continue this work. Mm. And if the, when the grants run out, is it like, is it, or is it just mainly maintained on grants? Like, how are you going to maintain this? So if you get a grant and this trail goes through, you need another grant to maintain it? Is that like? So, you, you, so you grant, the first grant, grant after yeah. Grant after you grant. need oh. a first grant to, get, to go through your design phase, and then you need another grant for construction, right. but then there needs to be a plan for right. how you're going to exactly. maintain like, mm -hmm. this with and the keep it right. keep it stable right. and, and sustainable, yes. Okay, so you don't have that answer of how you're gonna sustain the trails. Well, the trails, Here's the thing that's very unique about this project is that, and, and there are other projects like this, you know, the Green Line in Kingston is an example. Um, there are places that require less management, uh, but we don't want to build something that doesn't have the funding of management involved, especially being where we are. We've heard from the community, you know, too much too fast. Like, development is scary for people. And um, so, so how do you sort of take bite-sized uh, pieces and be able to say, you know, like if, if the town recommended to us, well, let's just bite off this much and see, that way you can manage uh, your expectations as well as, you know, what the project becomes. So do you understand so what I'm saying? Do you have, would you have money to sustain the trails? That's just the question. Well, we don't have that money oh, yeah, right now. Oh, no. Yeah, it's not we're at that point yet that he. Um, I'd like to just. I just wanted to add um, that it, I appreciated the little crossings that you already pointed out on some of the maps. Some people are already using 90, like for example, the Manitou School. I've noticed people trying to cross the road there. So there are natural crossings right. that it doesn't have to be one big trail all at once, as you said earlier. We can take those natural areas where people are trying to get across anyway um, and try to make it easier for them and keep them safe. Let's keep our community safe. 
Right. Um, if that's it from the board, we can certainly open it up to questions um, from the community. Seal, how are we going to do this as far as the microphone goes? We have, what about? One of them, can we move the microphone well, to the center? Or take, take, take one of our. Take my mic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just. He's got yeah. Jason's mic. I can't hear you now. All right, so if, if you have a question and you'd like to ask, we'll, uh, we'll make them quick and come on up. Come on up to the microphone, otherwise you're not going to be heard. Uh, just state your name and where you live, please. You can pick that up if you like. Hi, I'm Kristen Salello. I live on Main Street, 190 Main Street. I literally live at the intersection of 301 and 9D. And I guess my question actually relates to what we were just talking about, which is the crossings. I have an 11 year old kid who I'm terrified to let walk across 90 and 301 with the crosswalk. I walk my dog every day through the village and people routinely do not stop at the crosswalks in Nelsonville, at the crosswalks by the school, by the tennis courts, etc. So I wanted to know about the crossings if you're thinking, are we adding more stoplights? Are we adding more pedestrian walkways? Because it's terrifying to walk in this town, and I just, like, every day I get worried about what's going to happen. The, the speed limit, yeah. So I was just wondering about what that was going to look like on 90 and with the proposed crossings by Manitou, by Boscobel, potentially at Phillipstown Park, et cetera. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. So each of the crossings, as a, as a feasibility say, we're still, still looking at what are those crossings, where are they to be located, and in our conversations with DOT, uh, we are having conversations, what are the possibilities? So uh, there's warrant analyses that are required by DOT as to what can and can't go in certain locations. So the extreme side would be a traffic signal. Uh, a lot of times you need to show the demand for the connecting of the driveway or the road connecting into the, the DOT right of way, or is it simply just only pedestrians and cyclists having cross? And there's a, the combinations of balance between the crosswalk would be on the lowest end of the spectrum in terms of accommodations for bicyclists and pedestrians crossing a roadway. So in that conversation with DOT, which we had being scheduled for next month, and we'll be talking about the process to go through, and they're going to have a whole analysis required of us uh, in the planning process to decide what is a proper accommodation to make those crossings safe. Uh, from a speed look, speed standpoint, a traffic volume standpoint, or a potential user standpoint for pedestrians that would have a crossing at that location. Well, so you've brought up a great point. I mean, you couldn't have any more devices than you do at 90 and 301. So there's no way to make people smarter. I hate to say that, but <laughs> it, but it's true. And you know, you have you have a red light. You have crossing signals, you have boxed out, um, and, and we go through this, we have a crossing guard, the town of Phillips has a crossing guard at the Garrison School, and she's nearly been hit on several occasions, so it's, and there's a red light there, and there's, you know, there's a crosswalk, so they wouldn't address, I mean, you can't fix everything, but there's certainly improvements that can be made to make the crossings safer than what they are, so, um, and Putting in a red light, I can tell you, Nancy, you went through this process with us, uh, with the town of Phillipstown, to get a light at 9 and Fishkill Road, which is a high-speed intersection where there was crash after crash after crash. How many years, Nam? Five, five, six years to get that at least. Um, so to add a red light is, is a lot of process. So, Dan, is it fair to say, just for clarification, that the preferred routes that you mentioned would try to avoid the need for crosswalks by staying on one side of the 9D right of way? And then secondly, just to make clear that I think the goal of the Trails Committee, as I've understood it, would be to create a multiple purpose lane in the 9D right of way that was physically separated from 9D by some portion of property. So just, I think that's an important yeah, there's kind of two points. So one, we're trying to make connections with the community. So crossings, safe crossings are critical for residents to get to one side of the road to get to the pathway. That's the first thing. Yes, the goal is to stay as much on one side for con continuity, for safety um, within the right of as much as possible. And the facility we're talking about is a pathway that's separate from where the cars drive today, but within state lands as you can say. So um, a separate facility uh, for cyclists and pedestrians to be safe 
and then crossings at critical points to have those safe crossings to neighborhoods and where necessary because of land restrictions or other com needs within the corridor. I, I have a, the existing or the old 9D roadbed that goes through St. Basil's, is that state property or is that St. Basil's? I believe from the map we've seen so far, it's on St. Basil's it property. Is. It was deeded over at one point. Um, we're waiting to get all the mapping available. That and there's even a, a bridge. There is a bridge, That's yes. Still um, and the conversation with St. Basil's were in the conversations as to what they would allow and um, protecting their residents and their community there right. and respecting their lands. Um, we're in that conversation gotcha. right now. Thank you. Sorry, just for the record, it's St. Basil Academy. Yes, sorry. Oh, we <laughs> Don't want to slight them. Young... Come on up. Uh, for um, when you guys said um, that the, the polls for the favored routes. Um, did you guys interview the people like that live around there or just the general public? Mm, great, great question. Thank you. Um, so the question is, did we poll users or residents, people that live in the corridor, to what would be the favored route? Um, what we did was in the last three meetings, similar, very similar to this, uh, we have shown what a fair route is from accommodations for user standpoint, and we re asked for feedback in those meetings, just like you're giving feedback tonight. So one key point to that is that as this is a study, as a starting point, a survey that we're trying to get out in the next phase will be saying, what is your thoughts, what are your opinions about using 9D that may go near your house or within the road in front of your house for is that the proper place to put a pathway? Is it the best place? And we certainly want opinions like you to come forward because you're a user just like the rest of us. Um, no other thoughts? So on that note, um, I'm gonna pass, uh, just while the conversation continues, I am gonna pass out a form and if you'd like to write anything on it or have add your address, we'll make sure that we are communicating with you. Uh, I was puzzled by your sort of writing off the uh, train station parking lots, because while you're uh, thinking of a lot of utilitarian use, like open your door, walk to school, uh, the people of Cold Spring and Garrison would let me use this trail recreationally, and I see uh, parking at something like the uh, Garrison train station taking, I think it's called Marsh's Mile, I'm not sure, but it's the, the, tra the trail that goes all the way to the train station to Phillipstown Rec. Mm -hmm. So it would, people who don't want to walk all the way from their houses could drive their children part of the way, park at this train station, and then hit the trail and be on the trail for a reasonably long amount of time. Likewise, from the Cold Spring Station, of course, you can walk through the Foundry property. So I didn't see why there's not a little interplay of trails that uh, are on those uh, places that are near the river going back up to 9D rather than trying to run the whole thing along 9D. At, or even parallel trails, one on the, uh, the trails that exist now. And remember, Marsh's Mile is pretty, uh, um, what do you call it, level, too. And it's existing. Yeah. Right, it's already, and it exists, it right as in Barugi Road already exists, and yes. it's very level, mm -hmm. and it's very easy to walk. We do have sections that, that are theoretically, at least, in play here already. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, ask about is crossing uh, the Foundry Brook. You know, it, I don't see that um, the crossing would necessarily have to be done over the uh, car bridge. If you walk the School Hill Road Trail, has anyone been there? There are two wonderful wooden bridges that were built by the West Point engineering class. And they, they span shallow creeks. It seems to me if you are on the east side of uh, the road there, it's not that uh, steep in, uh, an incline down to the creek. You could put in a pedestrian bike bridge there and then bring it up gradually on the other side and avoid that whole, this is truly the most terrifying place for a walker crossing the bridge. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Um, I just want to take a minute. I don't really have a comment, but I want to introduce myself. My name is Victoria Caffarelli. I'm Chief of Staff to Assemblywoman Dana Levenberg. It's nice to email with you, Supervisor Van Tassel. <laughs> um, so thank you, Rebecca, for inviting us to this meeting. Dana was in Albany today, so she couldn't come, but we're, it's very interesting hearing all about this. Um, so we're paying attention and eager to hear what the community has to say. We, I am not a community member, so I'm not going to offer my comments. Um, but we are going to be back in Phillipstown for a town hall meeting on Saturday, February 11th at the Desmond Fish Public Library at 10 a.m., We'll be circulating that around. Also next Thursday, February, um, January 26th at 7.30, we're gonna be doing a virtual town hall meeting on Zoom. So we're, we're here to help in any way we can with any issues from trails to whatever goes on in state government that impacts all of you as Dana's constituents. So thank just wanna take so a minute to Victoria. introduce nice myself. Nice to meet you as well. Yeah, you. Um, and we'll be in touch yes. where we'll set up some stuff. Thank you, thank you, son, and thank you to Dana. My name is Heather Hamilton. Um, I'm on Indian Brook Road, actually right on Indian Brook Road. We love it up here. We've been here over four years. Mm -hmm. I love that she's passing around the form to fill out because we have not been surveyed or asked about this at all. Oh. We heard through a neighbor. We have attended some of the meetings. I'm sorry, I can't hear We you. have attended some of the meetings back in the day when we were having the disastrous COVID and the, the parking overflux the of people yeah. and I understand that you are trying to make a beautiful, safe pathway on 90, mm -hmm. but I do not understand how taking a pathway onto Indian Brook Road is not satisfying public more than the people who live here, like the private mm -hmm. people. Honestly. And I mean, speaking of someone who lives on this road and has people that don't live up here putting their face to our window and Very looking well in our house, it's, <laughs> it's frustrating. So I totally understand the need for a safe place for our kids and people to walk the road. But when it starts to veer off on that path and go onto people's roads that where they live and homes, and I understand there are homes on 9D also, but it seems like it's, Honestly. with social media, it's gonna become a frenzy. Well, that's what we, we need to avoid, making it a tourist attraction. That and like also like Sounds discussion. good. Thank you for coming and your comment. Appreciate it. Hello, my name is Mike Lorne. I live in Cold Spring. A uh, question for you. Is this uh, thought of as a four season path or is this something that is going to be open seasonally? And if it is thought of as a four season path, have you thought about how this would be maintained through the winter? Yeah, so um, one, I don't think we had the discussions directly to say is the four season path uh, as your question is. Um, but with most pathways within right of way, as they're treated as a transportation facility, uh, they're treated equally as a road. So yes, it'd be maintained uh, and a recommendation would be that it'd be maintained. It comes down to maintenance funds and what's available to maintain the pathway from a plowing standpoint. Um, but as a facility that's be used by the residents as local connections, just as well as if you're gonna drive to the grocery store that you can walk and ride your bike, that should be maintained and operated through the four seasons. Um, in the winter, that would be a plowing, uh, which we should have snow at some point, um, and possibly sanded as such. <laughs> uh, but again, and it comes to also other seasons, in the fall, blowing the leaves, removing the leaves as necessary, or in the spring, simply uh, picking up any debris from the winter months. So um, being treated as a transportation facility for connections for users or residents is the proper way that a pathway like this should function. On the counter, if it was a recreation trail, you'll hear most um, Ms. Pally say it's recreation, so we don't treat it in the winter. We encourage the cross-country skiing and other users to not have it maintained because it's for recreation use. It's at your leisure and your pleasure. But being a functional facility, it should be maintained, and that would be recognition moving forward um, as a facility for residents of the, of the town. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. I did want to really quickly respond um, because we, we did think about this. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, Heather. So I actually think I have your returned letter with me today. Um, we sent out letters and we got about six back. 
uh, we used e-parcel from the county. And um, some of them that came back were PO boxes, but I recall a named Heather there. So let's just touch base so that I can make sure I have your correct information. Um, yeah, so those smaller meetings, we wanted to really make sure that we reached residents. So we also reached out to Rebecca Schultz at Audubon Society and said, can you please forward this information to any residents that have had to mitigate the challenges that um, you've experienced? Um, and just another uh, thing I wanted to say that, that we are very aware of those challenges and that um, collaborative mitigation would be necessary. Uh, we definitely don't want to, um, you know, create signage for an already existing path that like is going to get worse, that doesn't have any monitoring or any management. We, we do believe that it, there needs to be management. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm Ellen Cadwallader and I live at 81 Indian Brook Road. Uh, where Heather was just talking about right there also in that same area. Um, my real question is, is there really a plan for an actual s pathway as well as the road that is there planned? Or is it to be using the road that exists and sharing it? Uh, on Indian because Brook Road specifically, it would be sharing the current road. There would not be a separate facility on Indian Brook Road as a neighborhood street. We have traffic dangers with just cars as they are <laughs> you know where cars and on you know curves and things where there's hardly room you know there's near accidents that happen so the safety is just a real issue that just the space i mean if there isn't a way to barricade off some part of an area you know where it's actually safe because people, they drive faster than they should, you know? Um, we can or, take a closer look, I think, um, as we're in the early stages of this process and hearing feedback from Indian Brook uh, residents, I think it's important. So uh, we'll go back to committee and let's, we'll look at it further. Yeah, really, just safety. Could, could you just safety. show us the, you know, how <laughs> Indian Brook on the preferred plan or where is Indian Brook fall in that? Because I'm just trying to imagine how that would be part of the traffic flow if you're way down underneath of the 90. Yeah, right, I know what you're saying, right. Uh, okay. So here uh, in the area B, uh, you have Bosque Bell, uh, you have St. Basil Academy below the screen, uh, and this road right here is Indian Brook Road, which uh, this dot here is the former parking area, which had many issues, as mm -hmm. I'm aware. Um, so this would be the current roadway. Um, if this desired route was accepted by St. Basil Academy um, to reuse their lands. Um, it would connect down over or under the current 90 bridge over the old bridge, 90 bridge, uh, down at closer to the water elevation of the stream, and then use the former not, uh, Route 9 corridor alignment through St. Basil Academy lands. Gotcha. Thank you. Steep right there. Hey, Dan, is it, is it just useful to remind you know, because I think it, people see lines on a map and they start to think like, oh, there's a final trail proposal. Is it useful to remind people that, you know, this stage of the process is the first round of a, a grant that the town got from Hudson Valley Greenways to look at alternatives, that in order to kind of do more in-depth discussion and have all of those conversations with property owners, along any route that's being looked at, there has to be kind of, it boiled down to a preferred route. And so this is just still very, uh, there, there's been no discussion about what that path could look like, what the map towards funding looks like. I mean, it's very early in the process and it's good to, to I guess, remind people that, you know, this is about beginning, I think the main point is to, to get public feedback and town board feedback to say, okay, this preferred route makes sense. It's worth exploring more and going into some depth about how much it might cost to build a bridgeway over the Foundry Brook. Is that, is that realistic to get at that level of detail to have more conversation? And I, so I, I think, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think we all understand. If you want to step up, or here, here yeah, you go. He's got I, one right there for yeah, you. I, I think we understand that it's in the early stages, but when a favored route is a favored route, it's, it's, it's concerning because it might be in the early stages, but before you know it, it's in the final stages. 
So that's well, why we're concerned. I think that's a long way off, yeah, but if, I, I understand. If, if I was to get every resident on Indian Brook Road to oppose this, uh -huh. what would happen if it's the favored route, but everyone opposes it? I'm, I'm, I can't really answer that, but um, at some point there would be a because decision. Every resident on Indian Road. Indian Brook Road is not gonna not gonna go for this. Understood. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, what would it's be just the other route. Yeah. But it, it is it is still a road, so it is part of the town and it's it's town road. So. And I'm not saying that that's, but it is a road. It's a, it's a right of way. So. Hello. We have no control over the village of Nelsonville or the village of Cold Spring. I just want to get that out there right now. So this, anything we get involved with is outside the two villages. So. I mean, it could also, I mean, the first phase could be, like you said, from Downey Well to Boscobel, and then at that phase two may never exist, right? I mean, you can do it in phases and then decide that's as far as we're going to go, possibly, but, right? Rebecca, that's, I think, what the problem is, is that, and I don't want to speak for you guys, but... The residents, maybe in Indubrook, they don't feel that you're listening because you're, you're not because you put up the favored route. So you can say that your committee is listening and that you're here to listen, but you're not because you're still coming out with a favored route that, uh, that our constituents are coming to us saying that this is, this is an issue. It's an issue with cars. You can't even get two cars going past their the same way we, we've been addressing so, issues on indian brook road for as long as for, i've oh, been yeah, on absolutely. a town board but i'm what i'm saying is that so we, we you do, say that you're here to listen but i i feel like it's, we do hear not. the residents of indian brook road obviously yeah. uh, we were yes, we do. Whole, I, I think, think i are. i think i'm speaking uh, we we listened to the point that we shut down the parking area on indian brook road it was an ongoing issue for how long ruckles how many years yeah. A long time. So we do listen, but I think at this point everything is, is an option, um, and I think they're listening. And if it's not Indian Brook, it may be a bike path on 9D. I don't think we're at that stage yet. I think we're still developing the stages of and if and when it does happen, where you know the route will be. So we do listen to Indian Brook, um, and we've responded with... Um, as much as we possibly can, but it's still a roadway. It's not a private right of way. It's still a town road. And I, I'll just quickly add that I mean I think we all have to kind of go into this with with the belief that there is the best intentions. And so to that point, I would say that even though the Trails Committee did send a letter to every property owner on 9D, we heard at a last public meeting some didn't get there. Even if Indian Brook wasn't uh, addressed, so I think what would come away from this meeting is it would be great to organize a meeting of Indian Brook residents to have that discussion and go walk it together um, because that's the stage it's at. And I think that is a good, that's a real good faith thing. And I'm sure the Phillips on Trails Committee would want to go have that discussion with Indian Brook residents. It would be yeah. really useful. I mean, that's the, that's the point of these yeah. sorts of feedback. Yeah, be the pathway or would it be a separate pathway? And the answer was it would be Indian Brook Road. So there's nothing to walk. It's Indian Brook Road. So you don't need to walk it. It's, 
it's not, there's not a separate, I think so, so I can answer that from what we have analyzed so far. The question is, is it a separate facility or is it using the right, the road right away? So from our first review of the corridor, it looks like there is not a lot of right of way within Indian Brook. It's a very narrow right of way. That is the reason why you're saying, we're saying using the town road as a facility. Now, there's accommodations that we can go through an easement process or approval process to have a separate facility. That is safer for bicycles and pedestrians. Um, we would go down that route as well. So in this first stage, looking at the map we have available, does not look like there's a lot of right of way. So that's the reason why you're seeing a favored route as being that corridor, but the facility type could, can be several. And I think to the supervisor's point, this is the first step of a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we have not heard much, if any, Indian Brook comments to date. This is our fourth meeting. Um, we're hearing them now. So in our process of taking that feedback in, um, the committee's meeting weekly to go through the comments and the stages as to how do we formulate that, how we consolidate the comments into what makes sense for the route, does something change, do we have to add something, uh, what goes in the final report, what's best for the town? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure why Indian Brook has to be on the route for any, a great way. It seems to me if you come through the Boscobel Woodland Trail, uh, you come out at the, near the beginning of Indian Ro uh, Brook Road, you can take a left, maybe walk half a block, and resume uh, traffic on uh, 9D, and then possibly re-enter uh, the St. Basil's land if you can get there right away. Because basically, if you broke the road, it's pretty downhill to begin with. It's not such a tremendously uh, accessible trail, except to get to the bird sanctuary and to get to the waterfall. So you know, I don't, I don't understand why so more of, uh, than a quarter of a block of it or so would have to be utilized, since you can get all pretty much over to the beginning of it, right through Boscobel's land. That, that is the option. Um, you, as you know, that there is a current bridge over uh, the stream, so accommodations within right away would to make a, a, a parallel to bridge or along the bridge as well, and then again to St. Basil's Academy. So we're in alternatives analysis stage, so hearing feedback, hearing alternatives, um, we'll talk as a committee to see what is a feasible alternative as well to be considered, uh, and looking at lands and where can where can it work? So it's a facility connection. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna give it about another ten minutes till nine o'clock, and then we're gonna wrap it up. So if we can. Um, my name is Tim Haskell. I live in the uh, village, Cold Spring Village. Um, Two things. Um, one, uh, on a positive note, um, I am Rebecca's husband. It is her birthday, so if you say happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> she's mad. <laughs> no, you don't have to sing. You know, she'll be mad. She's, she's already mad. She's already mad. <laughs> 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 it's a great way to spend your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the second thing now, I, as her husband, I've been to all these things mostly, um, and uh, and and they're, I mean they're very politic and very uh, diplomatic, too diplomatic to say it. But um, uh, no matter what road it's on, the one thing I am certain of, that group of people would oppose it. <laughs> that that has something that has been very clear in all the meetings. I'm not saying that you have that. That's a reason to accept it. I'm just saying it is very, I've noticed it is very challenging for them because no matter where they Tetris this thing, there's going to be a group of people that are like, oh, we don't, we don't like, the so it's like you got, it's not, it's like you were saying, they're not listening, they're not listening. That, I don't believe that at all. They've mm -hmm. rerouted this thing several times. They've, they've created several favored routes. They've, they've listened to people. I've watched this map change four or five times. They're listening to everybody, and that's the problem. And it'll change. <laughs> so it's like, so I do think that was an unfair characterization. But, um, but uh, I, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm not saying that that's a reason for you to, to accept it. You, you know, you can do what you want. But um, I just, I, I've grown to appreciate how challenging this is becoming to them because ultimately, unlike the trail that is not to be named like Voldemort, um, <laughs> this, this is not, I mean, that, it's all about, like, you, people are concerned about um, uh, 
uh, the, the tourists and how many people it's going to bring. I mean, the thing about that trail is that it is being branded and marketed like a tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is not going to be that. I mean, I don't know what kind of wayfinding you're going to be having or what kind of, like, arrows and, and signage and stuff. But, like, this is not, like, you know, come here, like, entrance to the, like, this is really some, it's sort of like an insider's trail. So, yeah, I'm sure someone might get wind of it. Someone might stumble into it. But I don't, I don't predict, unless you guys have different plans, that there's this massive press release to the New York Times about this way that you can get from my house to Bosco Bell. So, um, so well, I, just, I, just, I just wanted we, to make that point. As we, as we, <laughs> as we saw with, uh, with Indian Brook Falls, it doesn't take any signage. All it is is one person. Yes, sir. Uh, I live on 9D between the Garrison School and the Fish Library, okay. and I'm wondering what the board's opinion would be if they knew the trail went through someone's property, which it does in my case. Okay. Well, since we don't really have the layout of the trail, I don't know how that would really um, okay. exist. Well, the right-of-way term is being thrown around here like it's a magic wand. You mean the right-of-way of New York State Route 9 day? Yeah. Okay. I'm and sure that's pretty delineated. All but. over the place. Uh -huh. So I know there's no right-of-way to where it intersects my property. My property goes right out to the pavement. Okay. There's no way that trail can go through. As far as I can determine. Okay. Well, that's, so right. they they certainly aren't going to take over your property by no means. But I, I believe we're utilizing um, designated right of ways um, on 9D certainly. But obviously there are private um, partnerships that you would be seeking. And in, in yeah, to John's point, I think it's very similar to the comments. The last meeting where we heard is uh, I want to acknowledge that the right of way of 9D very significantly to his point, um, where some locations it's. 30, 36 feet, and it can also vary out in one location. I think it's 90 because that's where the old 9D intersected. So the width does vary significantly. Um, if everything you've seen so far of the line that we're showing, we're intending on keeping everything within a right of way as much as possible based upon the mappings available to date, GIS mapping or DOT available mapping right now. But in any process we have to go through, we have to get survey out to identify where is actually that limit. Where is the right of way that's the monuments of your property? And if you're on the west side uh, between Garrison School and the Fishman Library, the intention is to stay on the east side of 90 to avoid the private lands as much as possible. Um, so to that point, identifying right of way will be a critical piece in the next stages of the project to understand where is the property and is it truly uh, within the shoulder and stays within the right way as much as possible or using other institutions lands that are granted to the project to move forward. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Let's let's make it quick because we're going to we're going to try to wrap it up. Yeah, my name is Greg McGarva. Um, I live on uh, Indian Brook Road. Um, I'm supposed to chuckle. Um, look, um, I think, first of all, the, the, the planning that was done here uh, and the planning for use is going very well. I think you, there's obviously a lot of work went into it. But when you're planning something, uh, there's planning for use and there's planning for operation. And I think that there should be some more focus on planning for operation, um, which includes um, studies to see what kind of traffic you're going to have on it. And uh, then if you have too much traffic, how are you going to manage it? Because I think a managed solution is much preferable, much more preferable. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the intent of having it for local people, uh, fine, totally, totally supportive. But the practical reality of it is, all it takes is one or two tweets on social media and everybody's going to be on it, okay? So I'd like to offer that a couple things. One, um, I think you're too early in your process to put the word preferred route on your options. You're really just considering options. And I think putting a preferred route, that's going to steer everybody in one direction. 
and start to pe take the focus off of other options that are out there, such as going from Boscobel to the marsh, for example, with a raised walkway, and then and thence on to um, uh, St. Basil property and down there because that solves a whole bunch of problems. That takes everything out of the residential area and it gives people a wonderful walk through this beautiful marsh and then it connects with Audubon. So you, now you have Audubon and Boscobel connected and that's, that's a, Audubon's a big, uh, a big attractor here for both locals and out-of-towners. And if you connect that together, that makes Audubon a lot more accessible. So I think that just in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, I, you know, your, your planning is appreciated and all that sort of thing, but um, I would like to also suggest that in your, in your um, guiding principles that uh, you also throw the comprehensive plan in there as a guiding principle. And, and, and there, in there, it speaks to things like overburdening roadways and, and, and that sort of thing. But um, uh, anyway, so being so early in the process, uh, I think if I have an overarching comment, it's just, I think you're focusing too much on one, on one option when there are still plenty more out there. They may not be easy. None of this is easy. Obviously, you've done a lot of hard work, but there are some options that are available out there that could really make this really, really nice for a lot of people and make it managed, especially when you take a route from Boscobel and go out over the water to the, to the, uh, uh, to the marsh you have uh, the ability to channel people in there uh, and uh, you could even you know, use it as a throttle point. So um, thank you for listening, that's my, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make a very quick point before sure. we just, we're take one more question? Ju just the quick point here, I think, I think it's easy to, to imagine the whole vision of the route between Cold Spring and Garrison and just to also remind us part of the conversation and feedback from the board and people is phasing of this sort of a project. And so by that I mean if phase A was the preferred phase, then just beginning to focus on how to build a trail from the village of Cold Spring to Boscobel, right. which is phase A which would take a long time, also gives the community a chance to say, like, is this useful? Is this where it should end? Is it worth going further with it? And so I think we should also remember that there's a phased aspect of this project that allows us to see uh, if the community wants m more of it and, and to go from there. So I just wanted to point that out. So Jason, one last thing regarding that. We didn't say this in the presentation, but we abandoned the idea of going along the marsh because it didn't align with the purpose of the trail. The purpose of the trail was for residents to get to some of the places they need to go without a vehicle. And I think the but, more scenic we make it, the more tourism yeah. you're gonna get, yeah. without a yeah. doubt. Yeah. The That's more scenic it is, addition. you go along the river, you go along the river, you're gonna the have crowds. The thing was also, yeah. What's we, the we, not Got it. <laughs> go ahead, sir. We get feedback from Audubon uh, Society and, you know, regarding nesting birds, habitat, and we uh, want a very light footprint. Yes, sir. Great. So my name is Jeff Michelson. I live in Cold Spring. Um, I am a member of the committee, but I'm certainly not the most active member, so in a way I'm speaking more as a community member. And, you know, while we, I think this has been a great discussion, and, and while we, you know, talk about the possible routes, which have changed a lot, will change a lot, this input is incredibly valuable to that process. I do want to just refocus maybe as a last word tonight on the need for this and, and speaking specifically to this first phase of the project, roughly from Cold Spring to, to Boscobo, I, I, someone said earlier tonight that there is currently a safe footpath that connects Cold Spring to Boscobo, uh, specifically I think someone said from Food Town. Now I've watched, I've walked that route many times, I've biked that route many times, and I have to be honest, a year ago, when I found out my first child was on his way, I stopped doing it because the risk equation changed in my mind. It wasn't worth risking my life to do that. There is no safe route between those two locations, on foot, on bike, by any means. So, you know, we really need to keep focused on the need for this, which I think probably the majority, if not everyone in this room, recognizes, and build on that toward a process that satisfies, if not everyone, as many people as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Only, only because I really like you, you can be the last one. I'll be that one more. I just, I see a lot of listening going on. And I just, I want you to know there's a lot of representatives here that are listening to, and I see this committee who I've been talking to for years. I'm Nancy Montgomery, I'm the county legislator and was involved way back um, you know, in the Route 9D corridor study. And it's been a long time. This is the most patient committee I've ever seen. And the conversations you've had, and I see a lot of community stakeholders here too, like Bosco Bell and other groups. And I just left the village meeting where they were discussing parking. And I know I passed North Highlands and there's something going on there. And there's something going on in the library. And in every corner of this town tonight, there's pockets of people like us gathered talking about how to make this community better. So thank you to the Phillipstown Trails Committee. Thank you, Weston Sampson, for your really great presentation. I know this is a the beginning phase and we have a long, long way to go. And we have a lot more listening to do. I learned a lot tonight, but I am so grateful as I drive around this community that I know in every pocket of this community there are groups of people that are just trying to make the community better and safer. And I just, they're volunteers and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This gentleman's been patiently standing for a long time, and we could take one more question, and that is it. We're out of here. My name is Delmar Carlin. I live in Garrison, uh, off Route 9D, a uh, uh, short ways off. But um, I've looked in, I've attended some of these meetings, and uh, unfortunately, I was one of the people who never got the notice of the, uh, the group meeting, and there were quite a few people who didn't in, in our area as well as in Indian Brook. But um, I've looked into it some, and as uh, somebody said at the trails meeting last night, and this is really for the board, looking into the nuts and bolts very carefully is very important. There's the maintenance issue. We talked about safety. Uh, there are standards that the state has set, that AASHTO, others have set for safety, that are very critical to look at when you're doing something like this, and they don't make it easy. And significantly, the right-of-way question is critical. Mm -hmm. I've looked into the right-of-way, apparently more than Weston Sampson has. And uh, there are quite a few places along 9D where there's, the right-of-way is essentially the road. There's no place to add anything. Uh, unless you start to take private property, which everybody says you don't want to do. No. So those will constrain the options. And I think uh, it's a very critical thing for Route 90 and perhaps for other areas too, as to whether or not it even can be done unless you're changing everything. So I just wanted to encourage you to look very, very carefully and closely at the details, at the nuts and bolts. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you Thank so much. You. All right, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Thank you so much Thank for the presentation. You. Thank, Thank you. you to the Trails Committee.